Mark chapter number 6. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, Galilee, Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. So he went to synagogue, he did exactly what the law said, and he taught in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which he giveth a, which that yeah, which is given unto him? God. And even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. They don't see God working in him. As the Pharisees saw Satan working in him. These are the people that Jesus grew up with most familiar with is not this the carpenter all right so i guess he was a carpenter but when he was 13 years old he told his mother i'm about my father's business and he was sitting at the temple the son of mary yeah the brother of james uh oh you mean he had brothers and sisters joseph and judah and Simeon or Simon and are not his sisters sisters you know the Catholic Church would say that's nuns they do with us now we'll get the names here for a minute James that's Greek for Jacob now, I can't point at Joseph so I'm going to leave that one out Judah And I said Simeon by mistake, but let's say Simeon. Do you recognize those names? Those are Jewish names from Jacob in the line of Jesus Christ. His brethren were the names of the children of Israel. And they were, <clears throat> oh, this never happens, offended at him. What's the offense here? Who does he think he is, that carpenter's son? Look at his, look at his, his brothers and sisters and his mother. Do you get that story? She never had any courage. The Holy Spirit came and you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, do you see that Jesus has now been rejected by his hometown, Nazareth? We're getting our way to the cross where we read in Isaiah today, Israel is going to just be a folded up, barren vineyard. I mean, isn't anybody to see? I mean, come on. Jesus was sinless, right? He grew up in this area. Wouldn't, wouldn't Jesus be the one that never did wrong? The perfect child that every mother would love to have? No. I have seen parents get upset because a child got saved and got right and they weren't doing their drugs, alcohol, and all that stuff. That's sorry. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, amongst his own kin, and in his own house. And that's just the fact is, you know what? Your family, your friends, your, your hometown do not acknowledge a Christian. But Jesus said unto him, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, his area he lives in, amongst his own kin, his family, and his own house, his family, closer family. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. So when you look at all these people that Jesus has been healing, it took the faith of the people to believe and not just the work of God. God will not save you. This statement here. God will not save you if you don't believe in the salvation. So you cannot say, oh, in the end, in the general resurrection, we'll all end up in heaven. How can you go to heaven if you don't believe in heaven? Well, we got a hospital that's behind us. How come there are people in that hospital that are not 
believing God to heal them because they don't believe in God there are atheists in that hospital there are Catholics in that hospital there are whatever it takes your faith so for the work of God and he marveled look at and he marveled this is God he's looking at his creation he's looking at the people he grew up and he's because of their unbelief and he went about and he went round about the villages he had to leave and just all right let me give it one more chance let's go around and he called on to him the twelve he began to send them forth by two and two you don't go alone I've been in a church where I know a man, he did go alone because there was no one else that would go with him, and I'd go with him a couple times. Especially women. And this story here you get in the in the book of Genesis where Joseph was left alone and got in big innocent trouble. And I mean innocent trouble because he didn't do nothing. And gave them power over unclean spirits. And they never abused that power. I commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. Now this will change later. But right now under the faith of Jesus Christ. Save a staff only to lean upon. And other things they probably use the staff for. No script. <laughs> can I really put, can I spiritualize this one right here? No script and you know, for putting on a show at church. Okay. that's not the kind of script <coughs> this is this is what you would carry your money in a purse type thing no bread no money in their purse but be shod with sandals only thing what you're wearing on your feet and not put on two coats just one coat he said to them in what place soever you enter into an house wherever you go if you go into the house there abide till you depart from that place. And we with Matthew chapter ten, you don't go living house to house. You you walk into a, a town, a city, and one let one house take care of you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against him. And I'm probably not doing that. It can, can cause some troubles and problems. And what, you, what you're doing is, you know what? If this place does not want Jesus Christ, your dirt is not even worthy to be on my sandals or my feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? How many people did Lot preach to? his sons-in-laws well you got 12 men going out two by two over with Jesus himself you realize here in Daytona Beach they're going to get to give an account more than the heathen in Africa why because we are reading to them from the Bible what they're supposed to do there may be some people in Africa you know what they've never seen a white man with Jesus or the Bible and they may just have to rely on what they know about the sun, the moon, and the stars, and God. And their conscience. But here are cities where they're going with the word of Jesus. Sodom and Gomorrah did not have that. America, you got billboards, you got radio, you got television, you got places where you can buy a Bible, you got internet. Bible, 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 Bible. You better believe America will be judged strong. And they went out and we preached that men should repent. There's their message. Repent. That's missing from churches today. And they cast out many devils. 1 Corinthians 1.22. That's a sign to the Jews. 
Well, what makes you think you're a disciple of Jesus? You see that lunatic over there? Yeah, watch this. Wow. I guess you are. Remember, there's no there's no book of Mark right now. There's no Matthew. And they didn't carry around the Old Testament with them. That was at the synagogue. The signs, the wonders that you see, like at the end of Mark, when we get to the end of chapter of Mark, that the charismatic movement tries to steal. It's only to say, what is your authority to speak in the name of Jesus? Well, watch this. To Jews. Now, Greeks, I think Greeks said, require, right, Jews require a sign, Greeks seek after knowledge. What do Gentiles get? They get the word. 66 books. That's why I don't heal. That's why I don't take up snake poison. That's why I don't call down fire from heaven. Because I have the Bible to show you. Now, if we were living 31 AD, 32 AD, until the Bible is complete, then these signs and wonders would follow to say, this is my authority. And when God printed this book and made it available, it signed and sealed and said 66 books. That's it of the signs. Though the signs are coming back in the tribulation period, why? Because signs are for Jews. What is the tribulation period? Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? They cast out many devils, anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. James 5.14 And here we go with a remarkable thing. Amidst all work being done by Jesus' disciples, we have this little thing here about Herod. And it's written in the Bible. No doubt about it. And I gotta wonder if it's written anywhere else. This guy hangs himself. He concludes his entire story how, I don't know if he knows or not, that he just pronounced himself guilty for killing a prophet of God out of his own mouth. Then the King Herod heard of him, Jesus. For his name was spread abroad. So people knew. That little side note there is Jesus, his name and his works are going around. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. So Romans believe in resurrection. And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in it. Herod singing that this guy walking around is John the Baptist. Now, I don't know if he knew anything about Jesus before this happened with John the Baptist. So, Herod sees John the Baptist as Jesus and Jesus as John the Baptist. And I don't read anywhere where John did any healing or any unclean spirits removal. So you would have to say that the life of John was reflected through Jesus Christ and not by signs. John's life was so great, so wonderful, so perfect that when Jesus Christ shows up, he's, oh, that's got to be John the Baptist. Others said, this is Elias, Elijah. And others said that it is a prophet, a prophet. Or one of the prophets, a lesser, you know, one of the minor prophets. Others said, but when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. I killed him. Now, if Herod got right, I don't know. But if Herod never got right, do you see him at the great white throne judgment? All right, open the books. Mark 6, 16, it is John whom I beheaded. You just pronounced guilty murder against your own self. Your own mouth. And it's recorded in the Bible. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. This word of, of Herod killing John is for eternal. How would you like to be known eternity for being a murderer? He said, he is, he is risen from the dead. For Herod himself sent forth. Now someone's telling the story now. 
But Harry has already spoken that I killed this guy. Now here comes the story. I don't know who's telling it. And laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. And I don't know what the connection is there. They were still married and he married or caused a divorce or whatever it is. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. John walks in there, pronounces what, what God is, is foretold. It's wrong. Then Herodias, the wife, had a quarrel against him and would have killed him. But at least Herod had some backbone in his family, but she could not. If she wore the pants in that family, John the Baptist would have died a little earlier. For Herod feared John. That could be good. But it's not enough. He didn't fear God. He feared man. And fearing man and not God gets him a charge of your murder. Doesn't, that, doesn't First John say that? If, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And I know they're not brothers, but he feared man over God. It, uh, Herod feared John knowing that he was a just man. There was nothing wrong with him, like Jesus. Run your lies parallel with John and Jesus. What little we know about John. And holy. I don't know if anybody ever said that about Jesus. Did Pilate ever call Jesus holy? I don't think so. Herod, a Roman ruler, said John was, was just. Jesus was just. And he said John was holy. So you put him in prison and later on you have his head chopped off. How would you like to live in a Roman government today? Go ahead. Speak against Caesar like you do like you do with President Obama and see how long you're living. All he did is walk up to, the, to Herod and say, listen, that, that woman is unlawful for you to have. And he ends up in prison. Thank God I have the right to, to go down Daytona Beach at the farmer's market and stand up with the Bible and proclaim their sins that they're going to hell. And I, I'm not, I don't have to go to jail yet. Now there are countries right now, you, you proclaim before the people the truth about the Bible as John had. You may go to prison. You may even die. But that hasn't happened in America yet. Some preachers going to jail. But I believe some of them are a little radical, maybe, maybe. And some maybe going to jail righteously. That that's a can anybody say that about you though? You're just and holy? What about what about a Christian? Can they say that about you? And observed him. He watched him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod took respect to John. And when a convenient day was come. So it seems like when John the Baptist was in jail, he was respected and honored like who in the Bible? Who was in jail honored and respected for a crime that he never did? Joseph. So when a convenient day was come, we'll find out who the convenience is for, that Herod on his birthday, bad things in the Bible, every birthday a man got killed, made a supper to his Lord. He makes his own supper. He has his own birthday party. So according to the Bible, you, know, you want to be Bible? If you're going to have a birthday, you throw your own party. Made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. He calls all his military. He calls all his cabinet. He calls all the chief people of the, of the realm. It's my birthday. Genesis 40, verse 20 
not the other birthday. And when, now this is the convenient day, the birthday, now, when the daughter of the said Herodias, now we don't know if this daughter is of Herod or of Philip, or maybe she was, but this is Herodias' daughter. <clears throat> came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him then you see a story like this in Esther you know bring Vashai I want to do the hokey pokey and you know get half naked in front of everybody this woman's doing a little belly dance how do you know because she's pleasing them they're all pleased they're all and then that sat with him, and the king said unto the damsel, So whatever she does, this statement, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it unto thee. He swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask me, I will give thee unto the half of my king. So whatever this girl did for Nancy, It got him to open up his mouth too much. And this was a convenient day for Herodias. She's been training her daughter to do this the whole time. I don't know if this is, this is the gospel, but there's another gospel that said the girl ran to her mother, and her mother said, this is what you do. And then it says something like, this was the whole plan the whole time. I forget which gospel that's in. Maybe in this one. So she does her little dancing, the hokey pokey, and she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? I got him. Mom, he's putty in my hands. He's drooling. They're all slobbering. And she, she said, Her mother, Herodias, and isn't this a great mother? He, he offered everything but half the kingdom? Ooh, I'll tell you. You know that girl had a almost a blank check. You know what Naaman wanted with his blank check? He wanted all the Jews killed. Haman. The head of John the Baptist. That's the convenient time. This is a mother using her daughter for sex. I don't think this is no clean dance. You know, honey, show your body, do the boogie woogie, and get that man. Because I want that man's head on a platter. And she came in straightway with haste. So she's no innocent herself. Unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me, give me, not mom. So you can't ask it in Herodias' sake, because he said, You ask me anything but half the kingdom. This girl knows too much to be on the spot to, to give an answer. And by, by and by, and in a charger, the head of John the Baptist. This is fine. Why do you want it in a charger? Just, okay. I don't want to be cruel, but chop off his head. Remember David was holding Goliath's head? The king saw, okay, why don't you just, you know, grab him by the hair? Why has it got to be on a charger? And you'll find some movies out there that they, you know, the guy's beheaded, and it's on a charger. It's on a plate. It's on a tray. They got it out of the Bible. So you see the, the hatred that this woman has. She wants that head. Not only she wants that head, she wants it on a silver platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. I could think of a couple things that I could say about this king, but they're worldly and I won't say it. But Yet for oath's sake, I'm going to give you that much credit for the king. 
He bound himself in an oath. He stuck by his oath. Though wrong. I was going to say Japheth. Sure. There's a man in the Bible that made an oath to God saying, if you give me victory over these people, Jehari, something like that, it starts with a J, he knows who he is. I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out to meet me. Now, he was thinking about a chicken, a goat. I mean, the animals are running around the house and in the house. Well, his daughter came up to him and he sacrificed it. Now, he had in the law where he could say, you know what, that was wrong. Give them that much credit for their big mouth. They did what they say they're going to do. The lesson, well, what's the lesson here? Don't open your big mouth. Because you might be sorry what might you have to do. How many people will have to stand at judgment, lost or saved, that you were in a foxhole somewhere and you promised God if you got home, and then you, you got home and you never fulfilled? And for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. That's pride. I would probably don't know what I would do. In this, but what should have been done is taking this girl off to the side somewhere, whip her behind, put some clothes back on her, and tell her mother to get packing because you're not proper for this kingdom, you're not proper for this household, and tell the people at the table, that was just wicked to ask for that. But this is a nation that, you know, when they went to the Colosseum, thumbs up, turned down was, kill the guy. This is a wicked, perverse. So all these people, like, yeah, I take the head. I mean, they were killing Christians at the Colosseum later on. And immediately, the, immediately the king set an execution. Why didn't he just stop? Because of pride before all these people, and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. That's a sad story. And I bet you John never knew why he lost lost his head until he got to glory. He's in prison. Just think maybe he's talking to somebody about the Bible. Somebody. He's just sitting in prison. And next thing you know, he's dead, beheaded. And brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. So the head of the bat, the head of John the Baptist, is in the hands of the executioner, put on the platter, head handed maybe to Herod because he's the ruler, which is definitely handed to the daughter, which is handed to the mother. Talk about a hand me down, and it never does say what she did with that head. I can't picture someone real head just and when his disciples heard of it and I would think that would be John the ba John the Baptist disciples or Jesus they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb with the head I don't know I kind of like think of a joke when when Jesus died and the, and the, the graves opened up and the Saints came out I could just picture John walking through the headless horseman horseman to her gave him my head Sorry. I do add a little sense of humor to the Bible. And apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus. This is Jesus' apostles. So it could have been the, his the disciples in 29. But the apostles find out unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. They're bringing a report back of their mission trip. This city received you, Lord. This city didn't receive you. These people, man, they just treated me with respect. Oh, Lord, you won't believe how well they treated me. You write that down, that family. And, you know, I had this whole town, and they're just giving a report. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place. Now, with Luke and Matthew, you find out with the killing of John the Baptist, this brings the disciples into like a depression period and you're like, let's go off somewhere. And they want time to themselves. But 
problem is, he says, come ye yourselves, depart into a desert place, and rest a while. Rest a while. Get Jesus said, rest a while. Because he's going to tell them in the garden, all right, take your rest. The time has come. Then he says, arise and get up and let's go. I'm like, I never understood that. But he says, rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. It's busy. Busy, 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 busy. And they departed into a desert place by a ship, privily. So they go off. Okay, we're getting a little vacation. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran a foot by foot, thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came to gather unto him. Well, they went away alone, they got more people. Jesus is recognized just by who he is now. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and he was moved with compassion toward them. Because they were as a sh as sheep, not having a shepherd, no guidance. And he began to teach them many things. So he stepped in where, where no one else was stepping in. Where there's a place there's no shepherd, step in and start teaching the people. Especially if you go to Bible school. Get out there, go find somewhere where there's no shepherd, and become a shepherd of the people. The other thing I want to say, but and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came into came unto him and said, "This is a desert place, and now the time is far spent. It's getting late, Lord. Send them away." I mean, Lord, thirty-one. You said rest a while. We haven't rested. Can we have our rest now? Send them away. Let's get rid of them. See the disciples are always get rid of these people, will ya? That they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy them. So a desert place, there is marketplaces around this place. It's not, you know, complete desert, you know, sand and, and you know, dead camels. And buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. They're going all day and there's no food. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Now, that's not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to say, Okay, go ahead, send them away. You know, he just told them, By give them eat, you're going to do more work. But you said rest, Lord. You're going to do more work. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 pennies worth of bread and give them to eat? Shall we go shopping? We ain't got enough money. Told you, Lord, send them to go buy, will you? We want to rest. You said rest. And he said unto them, How many loaves have you? He's not letting them up. You're going to work. Go and see. Now they got to leave and got to go count the, the food supply. And when they knew, they said, five and two fish. And he commanded them, commanded, he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. Desert place, there's grass. Jesus is now making them orderly. It's not chaos. He's making them rest. He's doing the Psalms what? He's got sheep. What's he going to do? He's going to make them lie down by what color is grass? Green pastures. He is now doing Psalms 23, the shepherd's song. And he's going to feed them. How's that? You like the words in the Bible? Don't change the Bible. I, maybe modern Bibles has changed that green grass that you can't run the reference to green pastures. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. There's a lot of people here. 
I don't think I've ever been to a place where there's a dinner for four. This one's five thousand. Can you imagine five thousand men and not counting the women and the and the children you gotta feed? I, I would believe that you would not just need one caterer, you'd need a whole bunch of caterers. But you remember what God did in the wilderness to the nation of Israel? Feeding them? That was a wilderness. There was no food. There was no grass. There was nothing in the wilderness. At least there's green grass here. Jesus is feeding them in a desert. We had taken the five loaves and the two fish. His fishes. I never did like that word, fishes. He looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves. So you're supposed to ask God to bless your meal. And that may fill you. I mean, we're all fat and we don't, we're not satisfied enough because we really don't ask God to bless our meal. Maybe we wouldn't need dessert. You know, there's no dessert here. It's just the main course. Fish sandwiches. And bless and break the loaves. And, and I'm speaking to myself, by the way, on that one. And gave them to the stifles. Here they go. They got to work. Set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were fit. Now, this is an impossible situation here. I can't even fathom how this, when he break the bread. I would assume he broke it into 12 pieces to give it to his 12 disciples, which are now going to give it to 5,000. And he divided the fish, the two fish. I don't even know if there's 12 disciples. What did he do? How he divided two fish. And then, how did the disciples give out to all the people and all the people were eating full? You can't even fathom what happened here this afternoon. Of oil. Yeah. And if, you know what the funny thing about it? You know this is completely, the disciples are seeing a complete, unseen, unheard of miracle here. And when they hear that Jesus rose from the grave, they don't believe it. And you see why Jesus chided them that, in that upper room that night? You just see what you just saw. And we're going to see later that when it comes to the 4,000, they're fretting. I would just would love to sit back. And see how this afternoon went that no one even questions. I mean, you can see Peter. He's handing it. Where the heck is this stuff coming from? All I have is a piece of bread. And, and it would make you stand in awe. What just happened? I mean, this... Is the welfare system that America wants to do for its people, then Jesus has done it. But Jesus has done it after he taught the people. Did you get that? He taught the people first, then he fed them. And, and, let me get, and, soup kitchens are good and all that, but John tells us, why they come to the thing they come for the food not for jesus the people never asked for the food did they did they come to hear jesus for a meal no the meal was a bonus to the message uh, can i say it like that and the disciples didn't want to feed him they told him go get your own food as a bonus for hearing Jesus in his words, there was a need for the people. And Jesus said, okay, let's meet that need. They never sought Jesus for the food. Now, in John chapter 6, we read later on, they came back because they wanted food. But not the first time. And they took up 12. And they that eat were filled. Full. Oh, man. Whew. That was a fine meal. I'm going to lay down and take me a little Baptist nap kind of thing. You want one more piece of bread? Oh, man, I might take one more piece of bread. 
I'm gonna explode. Get that fish away from me. Whoa. We got dessert. No, you don't have no dessert. You don't need dessert with Jesus. The dessert you got is a desert. <laughs> How do you like that one? They took up 12 baskets full of fresh. Come on. I can't believe. I don't mean I can't believe. I believe it's fake. But I can't just believe how that happened. I can't believe the. the, the I can't even describe it. I can't. Five loaves of bread. 5,000 people. And now you got 12 baskets. I'm not saying I don't believe it. I do believe it. I just don't believe the method how Jesus did it. It can't fathom. Because you know what? Every time I eat, I consume it and then I get hungry. And they took 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes, even the two fish. And it says in John, little fish. Someone said, Jesus, not only is this fish, um, it's little fish. It's a little fish. Let's get that right, Jesus. It's a little fish. And when they did eat of the loaves, were about 5,000 men. And then you run to John chapter 6, verse 15. I, that's just totally mind-boggling. I can't, I can't fathom what, what eternity is going to be, and I can't fathom what just happened this afternoon. I can't. I can't draw it. I can't write it. I can't speak about it. I don't even know. And like my wife said, the, the oil in the pot there, she's just scooping it out, scooping it out, scooping it out, looking at it. Like, okay. God's amazing. Yet we don't put our faith in him all the time. Yeah. Straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship. The work's done. Now get in the ship. And go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. Now, I got a book about that. That's an interesting city to read about. The archaeology. I want that city. While he sent away the people. So he gives them a break, but they still got to work. They got to roll. They got to they gotta go over. So he sends his disciples off, and it's just him and the people now. When he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. He gets time away now. And when he even was come, 6 p.m. after, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. He's not with the disciples. They're in a boat. And he saw them toiling and rowing. They're having a hard time. For the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch, that's 3 a.m. plus or minus. About the fourth watch of night, he cometh unto them. Walking upon the sea. They're on the Sea of Galilee. Here he comes. I got the power, the great, great power in me. My father loves me because the Bible tells me so. Oh, hi, boys. <laughs> and watch this. Ready? Mark this one. Now. And would have passed by them. Luke 24, 28, 29. He would walk right by them. While they're toiling and, and frustrated and working and, oh, can't get anywhere. Jesus like, keeps going. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled, 12 of them at least, and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now what's the remarkable lesson we have here? Are you in life you got toils and troubles and problems? Jesus will walk right on by you if you don't stop him. Don't think, oh, I got this, oh, this this problem in my life. It, you know, what I'm saying, you're not going to ask God. Oh, God, you're going to help me. Not if you don't ask. He would have made it all the way to the other side of the, of the sea 
just stood there and said, you know, you guys would just ask me. You've been here a lot sooner. Don't expect Jesus just to take care of you because you're in trouble. You got to ask. You know what James says? And, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to quote the verse complete. I never could. You don't receive. You receive not because you ask not. These disciples, had they not said anything to Jesus, we got to the other. Well, Jesus, why didn't you take care of us out there? Why'd you walk up? Because you didn't ask. You didn't ask. And he went in unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They're just. Jesus is just doing great, holy, wonderful things before these. Nothing we've ever seen. For they considered not the. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. They forgot about that. For their heart. Their heart. Their the disciples' heart was hardened. 8 17. 10 5. 16, that's either 14 or 19. 3 5, Hebrews 3 13. The disciples had a hardened heart. That's a remarkable statement that Mark makes before us. When they had passed over, they came into the land of Gethsemane and drew to the shore. When they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him. Uh oh, guess what's going to happen? And ran through the whole region round about, began to carry about in beds. Ooh, we must have heard that story, lowering that guy down. They brought the guy in the bed. Those that were sick, where they heard he was. So here comes ambulances of, of sick people to Jesus, not in a hospital. And whatsoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets. Jesus had a street ministry of sick people. And, I mean, that's what it says. And besought him that they might touch, if it were but the border of his garment. Where would that come from? See, the news got out. That woman that said, oh, if I could just touch the, the, the hem of his garment. She went back and told everybody's story. And that story went out. And that story. And people started to believe her testimony so much if I could just touch him. You see, your personal testimony will reflect other people's lives. That's why we are told Paul tells his testimony three times. Your testimony may encourage someone to reach out and touch Jesus. Uh, it may not be exactly how you did it, but if you can get someone to Jesus and Jesus will do something in their life, then they will have a testimony. See, we are here left to be witnesses. That we might just touch, if it were but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. And conclude on that chapter. Much.